From the very beginning, this letter, this second Timothy letter written from prison from an apostle who knew that his time was over. He was going to be executed at any time. He has appeared the second time before Caesar. First time he appeared before Caesar, Caesar hated him, but turned him loose for a little while. and He was able to do more ministry. I don't think anybody planted as many churches as Paul the apostle single-handedly did by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit working in his life. But uh, he had that little window of opportunity, but then, boom, back into custody. And he knows when he comes before Caesar the second time that Nero's going to take his head. And, and he's going to finish in this chapter. We won't get to that part today, but he's going to say, you know what? <laughs> I've got the checkered flag. I finished my race, and uh, I'm a winner. I'm a winner. I'm not a loser. I'm a winner. And... Uh, We'll get to that in a week or two. But, what, but the, the importance, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but please try to imagine for a few moments the last time you're going to speak with anyone. We're visiting with one of Judy Firm's neighbors uh, just, just two weeks ago, dear lady, and uh, she's, a, she's a believer, and she was uh, home on uh, hospice care, and uh, we just, we had a wonderful conversation. We, we reminisced. She had done bus work, had done bus ministry. I believe it was in Ohio. And, and we talked about, yeah, the, the getting up early in the morning and knocking on those doors, invite those boys and girls to church, and then going in Sunday morning. Sometimes you have to go wake them up and help them get dressed in order to get on the church bus because mom and daddy just weren't involved. And, uh, but the joys of seeing those boys and girls come to class, we, to Christ, we, we had such a, a good fellowship. And then um, last Monday morning, I got a call from her grandson and said, Grandma's gone. She's, she's gone home to be with the Lord. And you think, you know, if I'd only known that was the last time I was going to talk with Miss, Miss uh, Denise, maybe I'd have said something else. Maybe there would have been something else I would have said. But uh, we fellowshiped and we prayed. Well, we'll pick up that conversation again in heaven. Amen. But Paul was, he was, he was stricken by the awareness, Timothy, I'm handing the baton to you. I've run my race. I'm done with my leg of the race. The, the, the rest of the business is up to you. And so he's going to take an extremely serious tone in the first words of this chapter. And I don't want you to miss the gravity, the weight, the strength of his exhortation. Exhortation is Paul's favorite thing. Uh, that, uh, matter of fact, he used the word paracleto, paraclete, or, or comforter, or encourager. He used that more than any other New Testament writer. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, basically coined the term in the sense of, of describing the Holy Spirit as the one who comes alongside of us to encourage us. Uh, but, but Paul picks that up and he runs with it. It's in every one of his letters time and time again. Uh, he is all about encouraging, but he is going to charge Timothy this time. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't like it when somebody uh, hauls me before a magistrate and I get charged with a solemn responsibility. Paul's saying that to Timothy. Now, Timothy is his son in the faith. He loves this boy. He has, he has, he has uh, taken him under his wing. They have served together. Can you imagine going on mission, mission trips with Paul the Apostle? Well, you never know how many members of the team are going to come back with you because he was in the habit of getting beat up, thrown in jail, stoned to death, and all the things he went through. But Timothy, what a rich experience going on mission with Paul the Apostle. So young Timothy is back at Ephesus. Paul said, I've, I put you there because I think you can handle this job, son. I believe God's called you. I laid hands on you myself. I've, I was there in your ordaining council, and I, by the grace of God, I know you can do it, son. But now he's saying, Timothy, there is one thing. Now, this is the last chapter of the last letter he's writing. And he's saying this one thing. I'm not just going to encourage you to do it. I'm not just going to say to you, remember my example of how I did it. Now, you're supposed to do it. He's saying, 
I am putting your feet to the fire. I am solemnly charging you. All right, you got a picture of that? Now I'm going to get ugly. Now I'm going to meddle a little bit. Now I'm going to plow a little close to the corn. What Paul is charging Timothy to do, he is charging you and I to do. And all God's people said, oh my. I don't like being charged either, preacher. I just loved it last week. I got my last deductible for the year, (laughs) $12.97. You know, the first part of the year, you got to come up with your thousand, whatever it is, the deductible. And I finally stopped writing checks. And uh, that's nice because they're charging you. They're charging you. I don't care if you got insurance. They're going to charge you what they can. But this is a, this is a wonderful charge. It's going to cost you something. But you know what? It costs you something to sit down to a steak dinner, but it's fun, isn't it? It'll, it'll cost you something to uh, go get you one of those big old ice creams from Dairy Queen dipped in that chocolate stuff. It'll cost you, but oh, it's worth the price. I don't know with inflation, it's getting less and less worth it all the time. And it's smaller than it used to be too. Shrinkflation. Timothy, I charge you therefore before God. Now, Paul is not given to swearing. And he's not given to throw, throwing God's name around to add gravity to his sentence. But he is as sincere as the resurrection of Jesus. He is as sincere as the Ten Commandments that Moses got from God. He is saying, look, Timothy, I am charging you with this because God has charged you with it. This is your personal responsibility. Now, he loves this boy. And I imagine he's speaking, well, boy, he's probably 30, 40 by now. But he's saying, God is laying this responsibility on you. Now, you know, the Christian life is all about receiving a gift. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We don't earn our salvation. We don't earn our way to heaven. Such a thing is heresy to say. It's a gift that Jesus paid at all. Paid completely in full. He said it is finished. But the Bible says not only did, did it is the gift of God, it goes on to say in that same chapter, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, God is going to do His good works in us. We are His workmanship. God is now in charge. God is now plugged into us. We're not running on muscle power. We're running on Holy Spirit power. At least I hope you are. Quickest way to get burned out on the Christian faith is to try to do it in the energy of the flesh. Can I get an amen on that? I have burned out so many times in my life trying to do it my way, trying to do it in my strength, thinking I'm going to do God a favor. Now... God did me a favor, let me wear out. And they say, now, son, are you satisfied? Oh, no, Lord, I am not. I, 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 I'm, I think I'm on the wrong street. No, you're on the right street. You're just trying to do it in your own strength. You let me take over. You let me do my works in you. And you'll bear fruit. Jesus said, abide in me and I in you. You'll bear fruit that will remain. Fruit that will last. So Paul is saying, Timothy, you and everybody you're discipling have been given a serious charge from God. Let's read it. Just going to read verses 1 through 5. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing in kingdom. 
Now, as if we didn't have enough holy fear in us, he said, and you're going to have to answer for it before his face one day. Okay, I got it, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting it. Preach the word. I love it when the choir does that song. Preach the word. That song is inspired by these, these few verses right here. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. We'll talk about that. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. That's that word encourage or parakaleo again. Exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, well, we're living in it, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers because they got itching ears. People with those $100,000 smiles and 50,000 seat auditoriums telling everybody how sweet and good and lovely they are, never talking about sin, death, or the devil. We are heaping to ourselves as a nation teachers that will tell us what we want to hear because our ears are just itching for it. But don't tell us about the Jesus who humbled himself, became a servant, humbled himself even unto death, the death of the cross, and we're supposed to have that mind in us. We have a, we have a culture. It's kind of like the culture of the church in Laodicea. We are rich and increased with good and have need of nothing. May I say, including Jesus, they have need of nothing. Because he's standing outside. Can I come in? Can I come in? Oh, we don't need you. We're rich and increased with good. We have need of nothing. You know, mega churches serve a purpose, and I'm not down on mega churches. There are a few healthy megachurches. I was talking to a good friend that lives in South Carolina, I believe it was yesterday, and they have a strong, powerful, thousands of people there. But you know what? They have the secret. They kept the big church small. They emphasized their small groups. Brother, you don't hardly get in the door before somebody's signing you up in a Sunday school class. That's, that's another name for small group. Small group's the cool way of calling it today. And... Uh, they get to know you. They love you. They pray for you. They call you to see if you're all right, if there's anything that they can pray for you about. I'm off the subject again. I'm chasing rabbits. But, you know, having a mega church is not a bad thing. But the trend of mega churches in America today is let's get a big enough crowd and so we can hide in the crowd and the preachers get the feeling of the situation. And if they like their big salaries and they like their prestige, they'll get to where they say, well, I want to keep these people around. They're here to hide. They don't want to get too much conviction from me. And so they water it down and they make it nice and easy to swallow and people say, oh, I like that. My ears are itching for that. It's kind of like, what is that old translation of the Bible? Uh, uh, modern news for good man. It, it, you know. By the way, I read good news for modern man the year before I got saved. And that's probably the worst English translation that was ever put out. It's really a paraphrase. But did you know there was enough gospel in there to convict me of sin and lead me to Jesus? So I'm not, I'm not even down on poor translations. <clears throat> there are impossible translations you shouldn't touch. But uh, anyway, let's get back to the point. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but heap to their, uh, to their own lust, after their own lust, heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they, their teachers, that are feeding those itching ears, scratching those itching ears, shall turn away their ears from the truth. Give us what we want, and then they give you what you, your flesh wants, and so they complete the cycle. They pull you away from God, and they shall be turned 
unto fables. You know, this is nothing new. My goodness, Israel went through that cycle time and time again. They had a few good prophets every here and there and now and saying, look, you guys, you, you're forgetting the God that saved you, brought you out of bondage, gave you a nation, defended your coast so many times, blessed your families, blessed you every coming in and, and going out. He blessed you and now he's going to curse you going in and coming out because you have turned from him. People haven't changed very much. I'm, I am encouraged that as we read about the church of Sardis this morning that uh, they had a few. They had a few that walked with Jesus. Now the rest of them, Jesus said, I'm coming for you. But to those that were faithful, he didn't have to come for them. They were already walking with him, you see? We'll finish reading. So Timothy... When I say preach the word, I mean, verse 5, you watch. That word watch is important. We'll look at it. Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. Now, one more time, I'm going to tell you this. I hope you'll get it this time if you haven't already. <laughs> Paul is talking to a duly ordained pastor of a church. But what he's telling that duly ordained pastor of a church, he's the same fellow that said, the things that you have received, you commit to faithful people who will teach others also, who will teach others also, who will teach others also. And the same charge that Paul is giving to Timothy as the pastor, as the lead discipler in that church in Ephesus, is that you charge every one of those that you disciple to charge everyone that they disciple to charge everyone that they disciple to preach the word and to do the work of an evangelist. I'm going to focus on that today. Four things I want to say. Number one, we're going to talk about proclaiming the word. We're going to ask the question, how do I proclaim the word? Number three, we are going to talk about proclaiming the word through difficult circumstances. And number four, if we have time, how does God need to adjust me so I can do all this faithfully? Does that sound like a pretty good plate to, to chew on a little bit? Some of you say, ah, that's got too many bones. I don't think I want to eat that. Okay. So when I say that this charge before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ is for all of us, I will read again 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Paul said plainly to Timothy, same Timothy, he said, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, you commit unto faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Baptists do not believe that ministry is limited to clergy, that everybody else is the laity. I, I wonder where that laity comes from. I think it's because everybody's laying around waiting for the preacher to do it all, huh? Not around here. Not around here. I'll tell you what, sometimes my tongue is dragging just keeping up with y'all. Y'all are, y'all are the best. And y'all are growing. I think some of y'all are in your spiritual elementary years and some of you are in your spiritual middle school years. Yeah, <laughs> watch out for them. And some of you are even in your spiritual years of being high schoolers and young adults. And you're maturing and you're growing and you've had the experience with God that's causing you to say, I want more. I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and I want more of him every single day. We believe that the work of the church is for the work of the church. If you don't believe me, Paul also had a little thing to say on that subject back in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. He said, God gave gifts to the church. He gave pastors and teachers and evangelists and uh, what's the first part of that verse? Show, show me the first part of it. My memory's failing me today. You got it up there? It's just above, above 12. I guess it's called verse 11. <laughs> just thinking maybe it is. It's coming. I know they're looking for it. It's somewhere right on the tip of their fingertips. There it is. Oh yeah, apostles. Yeah, this is first century writing. God gave four gifts. Apostles, prophets, 
evangelist. And by the way, pastor teacher is a hyphenated word. We say pastors and teachers because it gives the dual function of a pastor. A pastor means a shepherd and teacher means teacher. Of course, it does mean teacher. And so these four gifts. Now, get this in your mind as we go back to verse 12. These four gifts were given to the church. So God gave these folks to the church so that they could do the work of the ministry, right? Oh, come on. You've been listening to me for 24 years. You ought to know this by now. God gave the apostles and prophets and uh, evangelists and pastors and teachers so that they could do the work of the ministry for the church? No! No! Now, please understand. I do understand. Believe me, my 60-hour week schedule understands that my business is to do as much of the work of the ministry as I personally can do. I'm not, I can't quite pace myself like I used to when I came here in my 40s. <laughs> but uh, I know that the pastors and, and apostles, and it all, it's our job to do some work of the ministry. But now look carefully at the construction. This is a one long run on sentence. We're just going to look at this one section. Why did he give apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers? So that they would do the perfecting of the saints. Now, what in the world? Perfecting of the saints? Wives look over at their husbands. He ain't never going to be perfect. My wife gave up on that a long time ago. <laughs> She's learned to forgive and be patient. Amen? Amen. We could stand to do that for one another because we are all in a work, of prog uh, work in progress. The perfecting of the saints, it's a fancy Greek word that means to fix a broken bone. To take like a compound fracture, you know. It's bleh. And so to perfect that broken bone means to put it back where it belongs so it can grow together and be healthy. We're all broken people. Even the pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, we are broken people. And God is always working on us to fix us. He will never run out of stuff to do to fix us. That's why we need to get it through our thick skulls and slow hearts that change is a part of the Christian life because we were not born as we should be. We were born selfish, stubborn, greedy, lying. Yeah, you don't teach a baby to lie. Hand in the cookie jar. I didn't take any cookies. <laughs> Look over here. <laughs> Change is a necessary part. How many of you would like to become more like Jesus? All right, how many of you would agree that you're going to have to change to become more like Jesus? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've been having to take pain meds this week in order to sleep at night. Fortunately, I don't have to take it during the day. It works very well. I stay active in my knee. that's had the surgery. It's, it's healing well. I'm not in pain now. I'm doing real good. But you get pain meds in your system. You get the stupid ideas. You have the weirdest <laughs> dreams. And it's like, oh, no. You know, that's in me. I got that stuff in me. And God is working on that stuff. And the, the, just this is free. The whole business of the Christian life is putting off the old man and being clothed in the new man. It's just like changing clothes. I got up this morning. I was wearing my pair of black shorts and my T-shirt, and, and I had to put, take off, and then I had to put on. You know, you, you, do, you have to do that, take a shower in order to get clean. You've got to take those clothes off because they just stay, stay stinking on you if you just leave them on there. So the Christian life is about taking off and putting on. And God, the Holy Spirit, not only directs that activity, but he actually facilitates that activity. You and I are only a partner to that job. We participate in that job. We make ourselves available to him. And, and he does the heavy lifting. So back to what does it mean to perfect the saints? It means to help them to grow up and to become what they're supposed to be. My job 
as a pastor, your job as a Sunday school teacher, a children's church leader, a, Bible, a vacation Bible school leader, uh, whatever you do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're doing that to help other people become more mature, more like Jesus. Remember, the same chapter tells us that we grow unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is the goal. He is the standard. And if we're growing, we're becoming more like him. Anything that's causing us not to become more like Jesus is not growing. It's regressing. I don't know about you, but uh, I don't want to regress. That's why I went to that uh, osteopathic surgeon and said, see what you can do to fix that knee. I want to keep it working. I want to keep going. I got a lot of work to do. I don't think God's done with me yet. Let's see if we can fix it. I don't want to go backwards. I want to stay <laughs> in moving in that forward direction not just physically, but spiritually. That's the, that's the thing. And so perfecting of the saints, that's a good thing. Now, if, you, if you're not really careful, you're going to miss the construction of that sentence. Why do pastors perfect the saints? Look at it. For the work of the ministry. And brother, this is, I mean, I don't, I'm not a Greek scholar, but all, every last one of the Greek scholars agree 100%. That means that the job of a Christian leader, the so-called clergy, but we really shouldn't separate that because there's no difference. We have different jobs and different callings, but we're all members of the body of Christ. Ask me which hand I want to give up. Don't ask me which hand I want to give up. I like both of them, thank you. They work better in pairs. Like legs, they work better in pairs. So none is more important than the other. They're all important. So the, the leadership works with the entire body of Christ. And by the way, y'all are doing the same thing with them. Do you know that your prayers and your words of encouragement and your uh, preacher, I need to talk to you about something I, something I don't understand. And you pull me aside and say, you did something really dumb the other day. Uh, did you know that? And I, like an idiot, I say, no. <laughs> and because I don't, we all have blind spots. And you'll say, well, preacher, I wonder if you maybe had considered that you should have done this instead of that. And then I say, huh, you know what? You're right. So the, uh, the leaders of the church are not the only ones that are working on perfecting the saints. We're all in the business of helping all of us get those broken bones put back together and operational again. Amen? So that what we were designed to be, what we were created in Christ Jesus for, which is good works, we can do that if we are perfected, if we are matured. So my primary job as a pastor and yours as a teacher and a leader is to bring those that you minister to up to a place of maturity so that they will do the work of the ministry. I used to be a mentor, and as I mentioned this morning, it was one of the most satisfying and fruitful things because I saw the difference that it makes in a child's life Spend an hour with them a week and say, I care about you. You're worth something. You're not, you're not a mistake. God has a plan for you. You know, you don't have to be uh, overtly religious to be a mentor. They don't tell you you're not like a teacher. They don't tell you to check your faith at the door. But, you know, you can just love a child for a while. Just be a friend to them. Encourage them. Tell them they're worth something. Tell them why you know that they're worth something and you know, help them get through tough times in their life. Why, well, don't get me on that subject. We could talk about that a while. That's a good thing to do. Don't, don't miss that opportunity. But you know what? I could only make two appointments a week. That's all my schedule would allow me to be a mentor. Now, I don't even see a place to do it, and I'm, but I'm going to work on it. I'm reminded again of the value of it. So the business of leadership is to prepare others to do the work of the ministry so that they will do the work of the ministry. What is the, what is the primary goal of the work of the ministry? The building up of the body of Christ. Who's supposed to build up the body of Christ? Well, actually, in, 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 uh, in hierarchy and, and priority, Jesus said, I will build my church. I don't have to build this church. 
Jesus will build his church. He said so. Right there, it was it Luke 16? I went right to the place where Jesus had those disciples. And, and, and Simon Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, there was a big cave there that, where they would sacrifice to heathen idols. And a lot of people call that the gates of hell. And he referred, he said, even the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. You and I, as members of one body in Christ, will do the work of the ministry. And what does that mean? We are going to build up the body of Christ. Two ways we build up the body of Christ, and we'll move on. One, the obvious. There are more folks in this building today than there were last year. Do you know why there's more folks in this building today than there were last year? Y'all did something. Now, I've, you know, I have a part in that too. Because it's not just about y'all. I don't just sit back here, well, I'm the trainer. I don't, I don't do that stuff. That's below my pay grade. No. I don't mind going to pick up food. I don't mind mopping floors. I hate changing diapers. <laughs> I have gagged changing diapers. <laughs> Even calf pins are not as bad as changing diapers. but we're all called to the work of the ministry. So people, reaching people who were outside of the body of Christ and bringing them into the body of Christ. Think about the folks that have been baptized in the last couple of years. They were brought into the body of Christ. Why? Because you did the work of the ministry. You edified the body of Christ by inviting people to come and be, be a part of the body of Christ. Now, secondly, how do you build up the body of Christ? How many of you have made a discipleship friend and you have chosen to say to that person, God has led me to be an encourager to you. Would you be an encourager to me? Would you text me or email me and ask me if I've done my devotion today? Would you pass on to me the good things that God has given to you? Will you allow me to be accountable to you in some fashion? You don't have to make it rigid, and, but just to some extent, we all can build up one another. By the way, can I just tell you this? I, you know, I, I just, I'm amazed that people don't know this. Did you know the world is not looking for a friendly church? The world is not, I've said this a thousand times. I'm going to keep saying it because it's true. The world is not looking for a friendly church unless they're just looking for somewhere to hide. The world is looking for a friend in a church somewhere. We don't just need to be friendly. We need to make friends. If people decide they might want to hang around here, then we might want to spend time with them personally. Preacher, you're asking me to move outside of my comfort zone. I refer you back to the Lord Jesus Christ who left heaven and became a man. You talk about leaving your comfort space. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. You say, well, that's not evangelism, preacher. That's discipleship. Uh-huh. And you want to you do some evangelism, you disciple a few people. Then all of y'all be doing evangelism. Amen? Stuff will really happen then. That's good stuff. I haven't got to my first point yet. <laughs> Maybe I needed to spend a little time introducing what we're doing here. Paul is solemnly charging Timothy. Son, you're going to have to stand before Jesus who died for you. You're going to have to stand before God the Father who gave that son to die for you. And you're going to have to answer for whether you took that little talent that God gave you and you put it in a little can and you dug a little hole and you buried it in the backyard. Now, some of you might say, well, I didn't lose it. You missed the point. The reason God trusts his blessings, his gifts, his talents in our hands is because he wants us to use them. He's saying, Timothy, you know the words that set people free. You know the words that set people free. 
And you know why some people are not set free? Because they don't know the truth. Nobody has proclaimed the word to them. And so maybe we'll close this morning on the idea of this solemn charge. We'll go into the details of it in days ahead. We'll go into some detail with it. But I want you to see it, and I want you to see it clearly. You and I are charged to tell it and tell it and tell it. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're an usher, whether you're a greeter, whether you serve cookies and Kool-Aid in Bible school, or whether you sweep the floor or work on the building or mow the grass, your job is to preach the word. Now, I'm going to ask you this morning, are you doing it? The Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 12. You've heard me say it before. I urge you, therefore, brethren, I beg you, please, brethren, because of God's mercies, that you would present your body as a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, part of that is reporting for duty and saying, God, I don't like people. I'm an introvert. I don't like strangers especially. I don't like being friendly to people I don't know because they scare me. But you came to me and you saved me and you trusted me with the very message that changed my life. And I know that you are charging me to tell it to other people. I have a good friend that's a residential designer. He says, most Christians are hiding in their obscurantis. What in the world is an obscurantis? It's their hidey hole. They're hiding in their little safe zone. Now, I'm telling you, you've got to go to the store. You've got to pump gas. You've got to pay your taxes. You've got to go to the post office. There's things you've got to do. I ain't ready for a mission trip yet, preacher. Okay, don't go on a mission trip. Miss the fun if you don't want to go. Amen. Best fun I ever had in my life was on mission trips. But as you are going, preach the word. As you are going, preach the word. By the way, if you want to know the nuts and bolts of that, on Wednesday nights we're talking about how to be friendly. And being friendly is a part of sharing the gospel with people because they don't want to hear you unless they know that you're nice to them, that you're interested in them. Come on Wednesday night. Well, preach that cost me a whole hour. Yeah. But the returns are wonderful. Amen. Amen. So for this morning, wow, we're going to finish at 12. Is God tapping you on the shoulder? You. You need to get into the business of preaching the word. Well, Lord, I don't know where to start. All right. Right here. This is where you start. Right here. Now, you're not going to see me kneel today. This knee is not going to, can't handle being kneeled on today. <clears throat> but I tell you what, in here, I'm kneeling in here. You could start right here and say, all right, God, I am a novice. I am an ignorant novice. I am a reluctant, ignorant novice. But you can take junk and recycle it. And you can change my heart, oh God. You can make it ever true. You can change my heart, oh God. I could be like you. And that's his plan. But sometimes it starts at an old-fashioned altar just like that one right there. Preacher, all those people will see me. Yeah, but you know who else is going to see you? The one who loves you. If he could shed tears over it, God would shed tears of joy over his children. 
John said one time, and he had, boy, I tell you, he was speaking the heart of God when he said, he said, I have no greater joy than that my children walk in the truth. I got great joy when my children walk in the truth. And I'm telling you, God has great joy in you when you come to him just as you are. Say, God, I'm not ready. God, I don't know where to start. He says, good. You don't have so much to unlearn. Commit yourself. Make yourself available. Give your teacher, Sunday school teacher, a heart attack next week. Say, Brother Billy, I want to be an outreach leader for our Sunday school class. He'll say, be still my soul. A volunteer. I heard Brother Billy goes out there to the railroad and, to, and watch the train go through town to see something move that he doesn't have to push. <laughs> I made that up. <laughs> Is God nudging you? By the way, God won't push you, but God will call you. And God will draw you. With cords of love, he will draw you. God, we haven't got much time left. And I'm 70 years old. I know I don't have much time left. Most American men die before they're 80. That's just the t statistics. I want to beat them, but I might not. I've already had one heart attack. Only got a little time left. Yeah, it's a weird world out there. And no, there's not a lot of people salivating to hear the gospel. But I know in Auburn or Decula or wherever you live, there is at least one this week. And if you get up there at that altar and say, God, would you lead me to that one? And would you prepare me for that one? Let me shift gears for just a moment and I really will close. You may be here today and say, Preacher, I'm not a part of the body of Christ. I don't know Jesus. Matter of fact, I've, I've heard more in this sermon today than I've probably known all my life. I, I, I haven't read the Bible. I don't know anything about God. Do you know this? Do you know deep down in your heart that he loves you, that he's already spoken to you, he's already prepared you? You may be here today at a time of brokenness in your life. People get fired, they have a divorce, they get a cancer diagnosis. All of a sudden, the world is falling in around them. Let me tell you something. Those are the moments when God gets our attention. And you may be in the middle of one of those today. And God is just saying to you, I'm here to catch you as you fall. Would you fall into my hands? I love you. I can do for you exactly what you need. Come fall into my hands. God sent his son into the world. The Lord Jesus Christ became a man and he suffered on the cross to pay for your sins and mine. And then he rose from the dead to prove that he paid the debt in full. And when we come to him in simple childlike faith, God will receive us and forgive us and make us one of his children. Jesus told a man one time, you've got to be born again. And that's how you get born again. You come to Jesus just as you are. You confess that you're a sinner, willing to turn from it, but needing God's help. And you call upon him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How many of you know that's true? <laughs> Amen. There's a cloud of witnesses here. If you're here today and you're outside of the body of Christ, come. Come to Jesus, not to me, not to this church. Come to Jesus. He'll receive you. He'll fix what's broken. He'll wipe away the scars and the stains. And he will make you whole. And then he will empower you to live a new life.